In this video, we will talk about tra tensor transformations in curved linear systems. This is the overview slide here, which we will spend about five minutes on before we go through each topic in more detail and with more examples. The first thing I'm going to say about this topic, it's very much a natural progression from the video we did I think two videos ago when we talked about tr tensor transformations in general. So now we're in curved linear systems, but with our other topics about the curved linear system, the differential geometry and tensor transformation, everything sort of fits together nicely. So hopefully there are no surprises here. And if you actually had to guess how things work, hopefully you would actually be able to guess and you would guess it correctly. We're going to let our Cartesian system be our primed coordinates. So x1 prime, x2 prime, x3 prime. Often we think of this as x prime, y prime, z prime. And our basis vectors e1 prime, e2 prime, e3 prime. Our unprimed system will be our curvilinear system. So maybe that's um, car um, spherical or cylindrical. But it's our unprimed curvilinear system. It has coordinates q1, q2, q3, and basis vectors q1, q2, and and Q3. And remember for curved linear systems, we have these scale factors, H1, H2, H3, because when we go one unit, when we change our position vector by one unit in the, let's say in spherical, in the theta or phi direction, we're no longer moving in a straight line, we're moving across a curve. So the scale factors give us an indication of how much we're moving. This is um, what we had discussed in differential geometry before defining our things like our surface integral or our um, curl in spherical or curvilinear systems. And we, set, we have our set of equations that relate coordinates of the two systems. So we have x1 is a function of our q1, q2, q3. x2 is a function of q1, q2, and q3. And x3, again, these are our Cartesian, is a function of q1, q2, q3. And just to kind of give you an example over here in spherical coordinates, our x1, our x coordinate, is a function of r, theta, and phi. In particular, for spherical coordinates, it's r sine theta cosine phi. x2 is also a function, which, by the way, x2, as I mentioned, often we call that the y-coordinate, is a function of r theta and phi, and that's r sine theta sine phi. And x3, which is our z-coordinate, primed, again, because it's Cartesian, is a function of r theta and phi, which is equal to r cosine, gosh, this uh, ran off the edge, r cosine phi. I'm sorry, that's r cosine theta. And of course, this is what you would recognize as your spherical coordinates. Then to get our transformation matrix from Cartesian to our curvilinear system, or curvilinear to Cartesian, we have our transformation matrix, which is the, a, the ijth component. So a sub ij of our transformation matrix is the partial derivative of x of i with respect to q sub j. And remember, our x of i is a function of q1, q2, q3, as we have stated here. And then we have our partial derivative with respect to j. And then we need to do our scaling factor since our, we're in a curved linear system. This um, derivative isn't just going to be a straight line. We might be traveling in a curve, so we need to put in our scaling factor. And in case you've forgotten your scaling factors and also for uh, spherical coordinates and your bases, I've written them here. So actually, here's the scaling factors. The scaling factor in spherical coordinates for the r uh, coordinate is 1. For phi is r sine theta, and for theta is equal to r. And also, in case you needed it, for your bases vector for spherical coordinates, I have qr, q theta, and q phi. And these are all things that we had calculated when we did our differential geometry um, video. You know, if I had to redo that differential geometry video, I probably would put these as on the main um, overview slide because this H1, our scaling factor, and also our basis vector, those come up a lot. Maybe I'll even do a little video just to say, hey, these are things you want to keep in mind. But anyway, then we also have this matrix to go the other way, from, um, or not the other way, but from a curvilinear system 
to another curved linear system. And the difference is, is now we have two curved linear systems. So we need to put the scaling factor for the first, the primed curved linear system on top and the unprimed uh, system on bottom. And then I have this example here of the spherical to Cartesian, which we will go to in more detail. And then finally, if you recall, when we talked about just in general doing tensor transformations of non-curved linear systems, we had two ways of doing that, and that was with this formula here, except without the h of j because we were not in a curved linear system. But we had this other index formula that was so much easier. So we have the similar thing here. We have an index formula. So we're going to do this example two ways, one with this formula here and two with the index formula. We are going to start by deriving this formula. We're going to let a Cartesian system have the primed coordinates. So we have x1 prime, x2 prime, x3 prime. Often this is called x prime, y prime, z prime. And our basis vectors for our standard coordinate system is e1 prime, e2 prime, and e3 prime. Now our curved linear system is going to be our unprimed system, and it will have coordinates q1, q2, q3, with bases q1 hat, q2 hat, and q3 hat. And we also have scale factors h1, h2, h3. To remind you what these scale factors, h1, h2, h3, are about, back in chapter, I don't know, 3.4, when we talked about curved linear systems, we had this example here of the cylindrical coordinate system. You know, sp spherical is another curved linear system. But in this cylindrical system, our coordinates are rho, that's the diameter, or the distance from the z-axis. We had our phi which is the angle, if we project the point P, if this is our point we're talking about, we project it on the xy plane, the um, angle between x and that point would be phi. And the first thing we talked about is how a small change in phi also depends on rho, right? If we're over here at this radius, a small change in phi um, will give us the, a change with this arc length, this green arc length. But this same phi, if the row is bigger, gives us a much bigger change in the position of our point because the arc length here has gotten much bigger with a bigger phi. And of course, this is much different than when we were in just a rectangular normal Cartesian system because when you moved over one unit, then you cha your change was one unit. Whereas here, you might change one unit of phi, but it depends on where you're at. And what we saw then is this h factor, which is the absolute value of the change of your position when phi changes a small amount, is equal to rho. It's dependent on the, um, the radius, the distance from the z-axis. So this here, this dr d phi, the absolute value is actually equal to our h of 1. We just called it H. I don't know why, because they like to call it H instead of this D, D, R, D, P. But anyway, that is what this H was about, and you can go back and review that video if you wanted to see more. And then we also said the set of equations relating the coordinates of the two systems are given to you so that you know that x1 prime, again, prime is our Cartesian system, is a function of q1, q2, q3. Those are the coordinates of your curved linear system x2 prime is also a function of your coordinates of your curved linear system, and x3 is a function of your coordinates of your curved linear system. Now, much like we did our tensor transformation in our Cartesian systems, we're going to assume that our primed, our vector in our primed system is equal to a transformation times our vector in our unprimed system. And now we're going to assume a small change in our position. Our dr is going to equal to our d, and here this is our expression of our vector in our prime system in terms of our prime system bases. So our xi coordinate times our bases, ei bases. And that will equal to, it's going to be the same in our other coordinate system, our unprimed curve linear system. But we also need to put in now our scaling factor, since this is not a Cartesian system, but it's curved linear. And then this component here, the change in the x of i, is related to this side here by our 
matrix, our transformation matrix. Now, just focusing on this left-hand side, the derivative of x of i prime, first, each of our x of i, our x1, x2, x3, they're all functions of q1, q2, q3, right? So the prime coordinates are functions of the unprimed coordinates, q1, q2, q3. So I have that written here. So our x of i is a function of q1, q2, q3. And our derivative then is equal to the sum of our partial derivative with respect to q1, q2, plus partial derivative with respect to q3. So remember here you have to do the summation. Next, in order to relate this dx of i to this equation over here in green, I need to introduce my h of j. So I'm going to do that by multiplying by h of j, but then also dividing by h of j. And now what you see if you compare these two equations, remember I multiplied by h of j specifically, so it would look like this. I have my dx of i, I have my partial derivative, my h of uh, my h of j dq of j, that's over here. So that must mean this portion here is equal to my a sub i j. So that's what I've written out. My a sub i j entry in my um, transformation matrix A is partial derivative of x of i prime, q1, q2, q3, over h of j dq dj. And that this goes from curve linear to Cartesian. And then over here, I have my um, formula to go from curve linear to curve linear. So for example, from cylindrical to spherical. And what you need to do there is on the top, you're going to have to multiply by h of i prime. On the bottom, you have the h of i in the unprimed system. But now we really want to do an example to put this all together. Here we have our Cartesian coordinate notes that our x1 prime is equal to x prime, it's a function of r theta phi, and it's equal to r sine theta cosine phi, our x2 prime, that's equal to y prime, or we're defining it as y prime, r theta phi, r sine theta sine phi, and x3 is going to be defined as our z prime, r theta phi is equal to r cosine theta. So these are our spherical coordinates that you hopefully recognize. Here is our formula that we get for our matrix, and this is to go from curve linear to Cartesian. So, um, and last, I put in our, our scale factors for h r, h theta, and uh, h phi, and h theta. Also on the bottom, I have our two matrices so this is to go from spherical to Cartesian. Here's the solution to go from Cartesian to spherical. I'm going to be deriving this matrix here, this transformation here. We are going to start with our A11 um, element, which is this element here. So plugging into our formula, A sub i, so that will be A sub 1 prime, q1, q2, q3. And I'm just going to remind myself what the function is of x1, right, because we're doing x1 prime, and that's r sine theta cosine theta. So technically this is actually x of i, so I shouldn't even put the x of i here, but I, I did for no good reason. Then our h of j, so in this case this is h of the first coordinate in our spherical coordinate system. Our first coordinate is r, so that's equal to 1, and then we have uh, d q j, so dq1 is, again, our first coordinate is dr. So I'm going to take the partial derivative of this function with respect to r, and that will be sine theta cosine phi. So that's exactly this um, element here. Next, when I go for a12, so here I have a12, so dxi, so i is still equal to 1, and we still have our function of r, theta and phi, which is r sine theta cosine phi, and then our h of j. In this case, h of j is the second coordinate, so that's theta. So h of theta is equal to r, so I have an r on the bottom, and I'm taking the partial derivative, or I put h of theta here, I'm taking the partial derivative with respect to theta of this function here, so that will be r, and then um, and cosine phi is a constant, so that stays, but our derivative of sine of theta is cosine theta. And then again, I have to divide by h of 
theta, which is r, and then I get cosine theta, cosine phi, which, which is this a12 is this element here. Last, I have a13. So again, I, I'm still at dx of 1 with respect to the third element of my, uh, my third element of my, where is that, dq of j. So that will be, the third element is going to be phi. So, I, oh, and I also have my r side theta cosine theta here. Uh, so h of j, that is going to be h of phi, which is equal to r. So here I have h of phi, it's equal to r. And then uh, d, oh wait, h of phi, that's h of theta. So it's r sine theta, h of phi is r sine theta. And then the partial derivative with respect to phi, so the r sine theta stays, it's a constant uh, derivative of cosine of phi is negative sine of phi. So when I divide by h of r, I am left with minus sine of phi, and that's this element here. I'm going to increment i to 2 now, and I'm going to do j equals 1, 2, and 3. So now I have dx of i prime, so that's dx2 prime, I should have put the prime there. And then my function for x2 is equal to r sine theta sine phi. So I wrote that here, r sine theta sine phi. My h of j, so first I have h1, the first coordinate is r, so I need my h of r is 1. Partial derivative with respect to r here, I get sine theta sine phi divided by 1, sine theta sine phi, that's this element here, the 2, 1, second row, first column. A2, 2, so again, dx i, so i is 2, so dx 2, so I come over here, and my function is r sine theta sine phi, my h of j, so my second uh, element, which is theta, so h of theta is equal to r, so I have h of theta here, I have r here. Now I take the partial derivative of this with respect to h of j again, second element, theta. So it's r cosine theta sine phi divided by r, and I get sine, cosine theta sine phi over here for my 2, 2 element. And finally for 2, 3, again, two, dx2 prime, the second x2 prime is r sine theta sine phi, r sine theta sine phi, yep. And then my h of j and my dq of j, um, in this case j is 3, the third element is phi, so h of phi and dq of phi. So h of phi is equal to r sine theta, which is on the bottom, and then partial derivative with respect to phi, I get r sine theta cosine phi. And dividing by h of r, I get cosine phi, which is this element here. I increment my i to 3, and I let j equal 1, 2, 3. I get my next three elements that are over here. So this is my final matrix. So this is how you use this formula here to find uh, the transformation matrix from spherical to Cartesian. And now that we've done this example here, this is what we just finished. I also put this QR, QP, Q, theta here. Actually, we're going to use that here in the index formula. But anyway, we just finished that example. So I want to do another example using our transformation matrix. Here I have my two formulas to convert. So to go from spherical to Cartesian, right, if these are my spherical, this is going to be my x-coordinate in Cartesian, my y-coordinate in Cartesian, and my z-coordinate in Cartesian. I'm not sure why I decided to write it this way, but you can read it off and see how to convert to x, y, and z. And, you know, you're told that this is the x because it's in the x direction. This is y because it's in the y direction. This is z because it's in the z direction. And then this is the formula which you should be familiar with to convert from Cartesian to spherical. So r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Uh, this next one for phi, we have inverse cosine r cosine x over x squared plus y squared. I'm used to a tangent formula, but I'm using this because this is the one that's in your book. And theta is equal to the inverse cosine z over r. To convert this point negative 2, negative 3, 4 to spherical, we just use these formulas here. Remember, we're only converting a point, not a vector. So in other words, we have this point where we go negative 2 in the x direction, negative 3 in the y direction, and then up. 
before in the z direction, we have this point. We want to know what the coordinate of this point is in spherical coordinates. So we use this formula here. So r is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which is approximately 5.385. V, we're using this formula here, is the inverse cosine of minus 2 over x squared plus y squared, which is 127 point, uh, 123.7 degrees. And theta will be equal to 4 over or the inverse cosine of 4 over x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which is just r, which is 42 degrees. Our next question is transform the vector. So it's not just a point, but it's a vector in our space to spherical coordinates. So that's where I would use this transformation here to spherical. So I'll use this transformation here. So I have my sine theta cosine phi, cosine theta cosine phi minus sine theta. Uh, phi, and then sine theta sine phi, cosine theta sine phi, cosine phi, cosine theta minus sine theta 1, and then I plug in my point 4, negative 2, 4. And this is the vector I get, 4 sine theta cosine phi minus 2 sine theta uh, minus sine phi minus 4 cosine theta, that's the first coordinate. The second one is 4 cosine theta cosine phi phi minus 2 cosine theta sine phi plus 4 sine theta. And finally, my last coordinate is minus 4 sine theta uh, phi minus 2 cosine phi minus 4. And what you notice is that this here, the transformation depends on where you're at, in particular on the theta and the phi. So in other words, if I want to represent this vector 4, negative 2, negative 4, at the point negative 2 minus 3, 4, we already looked at what our spherical coordinates are for this point, minus 2, minus 3, 4. Here we got r is equal to 5.385, uh, phi is equal to 123.7, and theta is equal to 42 degrees. So to represent this vector at this point, then our r theta phi is equal to, we plug in 4 sine at this point, our theta will be 42 degrees, and our phi, so cosine phi is cosine of 123 minus sine of 42, sine of 123 minus 4, cosine of 42. And you can see the, the other three rows are filled in similarly, similarly. The last topic we are going to look at is this index formula. So it's like, do you remember when we had a previous video when we did tensor transformation in Cartesian coordinates and we did it based on writing one set of vectors in terms of the other vectors, then we did it based on this formula here. And then finally, the easiest thing is we did it based on this index formula, but we do need to know the basis for the index formula. And our example is still going to be the spherical to Cartesian coordinates, which I kept all these notes here, including the transformation matrix. But for the index formula, we do need, to, as I said, the basis formula. So I took this from our previous video when we talked about curved linear systems and the basis vectors. So I have my QR, my Q of theta, and my Q of phi. For a of 1, 1, according to this formula, I'm going to take my bases in my primed system, and my primed system is the um, non-spherical, the Cartesian. So that's just E1, and I'm going to dot it with my j, in this case that's j is 1, uh, bases vector in my, my spherical coordinate system. So that's this one here, qr. So E1 is 1, 0, 0, qr is sine theta cosine phi sine theta sine phi cosine theta. When I dot it with this 1, 0, 0, I'm picking out the first element. So that's going to be sine theta cosine phi. And here you can see that this is the same, where am I going? I'm going to this one, right? Sine theta cosine phi. Next, for A12 over here, I need my Q1 in the prime system. So again, that's E1. And then I need my Q sub J. J is equal to 2. So that's my second element. That's my theta. So I have my E00 times my Q theta. That basis vector is cosine theta, cosine phi, cosine theta, sine phi, and minus sine theta. When I dot it with my 1, 0, 0, I pick out my first element and I get cosine theta, cosine phi, which is what I had before. 
for A13, again, I pick out my E1 vector, and then my third uh, basis vector in the unprimed system, that's Q phi. So I'm going to essentially pick out the first element of Q phi. So that's going to be minus sine theta, which is what I had before. When I go to A21, now in my primed system, I need my second basis coordinate, which is E2, which is 0, 1, 0. So now I'm going to be picking out the second element of my QR basis. So I'm going to get sine theta sine phi. When I do A22, that's E2 and Q beta, I'm going, because of the E2, I'm going to pick out the second element, which is cosine theta sine phi. And then you can see the rest. You can check the rest. It's um, the same. To review what we've done in this video, we discussed tensor transformation in curved linear system. So we let our Cartesian system be the primed coordinates x1, x2, x3 with basis vectors e1 prime, e2 prime, and e3 prime. And then we had our curved linear system would be the unprimed system with q1, q2, q3 coordinates and basis vector q1 hat, q2 hat, q3 hat. And scalar factors for the curved linear system, h1, h2, h3. Then we had a set of equations relating the coordinates. So we said that our x1, which is often defined as x, is a function. So of our prime system, our Cartesian system, we can write it as a function of coordinates in our curved linear system. And x2, we can write that also as coordinates of our curved linear system, and x3, we can write that as coordinates of our curved linear system. And this was our example here in spherical coordinates. So our x1 prime could be written as um, an equation of our curved linear system, that is r, theta, and phi. And in spherical coordinates, our x1 prime is equal to r sine theta cosine phi. x2 in Cartesian coordinates, often we refer to that as our y coordinate. So y prime is, can also be written as a linear combination of r, theta, phi, and we have it here, and x3 is our z coordinate. So that's what this is about here. And then we said we can make our matrix to go from linear to Cartesian coordinates using this formula here. So a sub ij is the partial derivative with respect to the ith coordinate in our primed system with respect to our j variable in our unprimed system. And then our, also, I, this reminds you that x sub i, x sub 2, and x sub 3, x sub i is a function of q1, q2, q3. And then we also need to divide by the scale factor. We have the similar formula to go from a curve linear to curve linear, for example, from spherical to um, cylindrical, or maybe it's elliptical. But what we need to do is add this h1, the scale factor in our prime system, on the um, numerator. Anyway, we did our example with spherical coordinates. And then the last thing we did is we used this index formula. So there are two ways we can get these, uh, our matrix. One with this formula here, and the other is to use our a sub ij element of our matrix would be q sub i in our primed system dotted with q sub j in our unprimed system. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching.